Yo, 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 yo. Hopefully I am live and hopefully you can see me. Thank you for joining us. Um, good afternoon, evening, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. I don't know what rap record that is from. It's from some rap record at some point. But anyway, look, if it's the first time that you're joining us, subscribe to the channel and like it and share it. All of that good stuff. Do check out the other videos on the channel. Do check out the other videos on the channel. I'm going to be taking a little bit of a detour today. Well, I've been taking a detour, <clears throat> but I will be taking a bit of a detour in this one. But I'm going to, you know, as as the old, uh, as old Jamaican people used to say, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Or is that old Nigerians? I, I really don't know. Um, but anyway, look, subscribe to the channel. I say once again, like the video. Um, like the video and share it as well because and and comment as well because it all of that helps the uh, the YouTube algorithm all of it helps that but look um <laughs> let me take this down for a minute because I want to talk to you before I even put it up so listen um we're gonna be looking at three or four topics today three topics today four topics today right one of them is what happened with Diane Abbott. For those of you that don't know Diane Abbott, Diane Abbott is a long time or was a, is a long time Labour MP in the UK. For those that don't know, uh, similar to what you've got in the States, uh, in America, you've got the Republicans and the Democrats. In the UK, we've got the Labour Party on one hand. That's Tony Blair's old dodgy party. Remember that guy, remember that guy Tony Blair, that said, uh, what, what, what nonsense did he say with uh, Bush Jr.? What nonsense was that? I can't remember, but anyway, went to war under false pretenses back in the day, yeah, to the point where that part of the world is still unstable, but that's another conversation. <laughs> that's another conversation. But anyway, Diane Abbott was a member of the Labour Party. She's been the longest female, I think female, I don't just think black female serving MP, but the longest um, female serving MP, I think, 30 something years, 30 something years, I think close to 40 years. Um, and I remember when her, was it Paul Boateng and another, was it Bernie Grant? When or Bernie Grant's passed away, when all three of them came into parliament. And uh, what, did, what did Paul Boateng say? I can't remember, but look up his classic quote. It's hilarious. Um, but anyway, I remember when the three of them came into Parliament, I was a little kid at the time, and by the sound of their voices, it seemed like everything was going to change, but nothing did, right? <laughs> Today, you know, and, and since then, to her credit, she's had something called London Schools and the Black Child, to her credit, where she looked at uh, the state of education for black children across uh, across London. But anyway, we're going to be looking at what happened to her. Or well, actually, didn't well. We look at some of the stuff that happened to her, but the comments, racist comments, that were directed at her by a rich Tory party donor who's apparently donated no less than ten million British pounds, ten million British pounds to the Tory party, which is a thing in itself but anyway this man thought it wise to make some dodgy comments about dearly beloved diane abbott dearly beloved diane abbott that many including myself would consider racist but that's not even the main point <laughs> we'll come to what the main point is in a in a moment also going to be looking at a conversation that happened on a podcast called The Standard of Truth, which is a Christian, uh, uh, African-American Christian podcaster, brilliant podcaster. Do go and check out her channel. It's called The Standard of Truth. Great. You know, she she's a, um, you, you know, she knows her Bible. Um, and, um, you know, the recent, we're going to be talking about the recent conversation, her recent live, which was, I don't know if it, it wasn't her last live, but I think it was about two or three lives ago. The conversation was called, is the black church in trouble? Is the black church in trouble? I think it is. But I think it's been in trouble for years. 
for years. And I, you know, we'll come back to that and we will talk about that. And we're also going to be uh, talking about um, about Kenyan women. Right? Um, those of you that have been following my channel, you know that I've been looking at apartments and houses and the whole thing about uh, men in general, black men in particular, relocating from the West to non-Western countries, specifically the African continent. Started out with Ghana. We were looking at apartments and uh, and houses, and literally beginning to um, well, well, how you could earn money out of property in a very simple way, which is just basically Airbnb. We were looking at that in Ghana, and then we've begun looking at that in Kenya as well. And we're going to carry on with that. By the way, we're going to be looking at other African countries, but we're going to continue with Kenya because we've not finished with Kenya. We've only done literally Nairobi. I don't even think we've looked at. I've looked at. I don't even think I've looked at property in Mombasa, which is, if you like, the second city or the holiday city. So we're going to be definitely looking at that. We're going to be looking at that. Um, and how you can make money in, well, whether it be passive income or active income, if you like, um, in Kenya, Ghana, and across the African continent, depending on what um, country, city you want to relocate to. Uh, the, the, the reason why I'm doing that is why I've gotten to the point where, and I've said it a few times on this channel, I can't see the point talking about modern independent women. I can't see the point anymore simply because I don't think they're going to change. I don't think they're going to change. And I think it's more about, and there's, there's enough messages out there, right? I think it's about talking to men about what the possibilities for a full, fruitful life is elsewhere. What are the possibilities? What, you know, what, what kind of a life can you, as a black man born and brought up in the West, what kind of a life might be available to you elsewhere in the world, on the globe? So I'd rather focus on that, right? Um, I think that makes sense. I think for a lot of men, I think that's a solution, not for all men. And I want to make it clear. And I'm going to keep saying it in these streams. There's aspects of living in the UK that I love or like, right? Um, you know, um, God, me and the wife went to see the Lion King the other day. It was her birthday. So I took her to see the Lion King. You know, we just stayed in a London hotel. We went for a walk around London and I've not really been for a walk around London for a long time. In fact, I've actually avoided central London for years. So it was quite interesting walking around some of the same streets where we used to club and go parties or club, nightclub. There used to be nightclubs in London. They've all gone right? The government's decided to, I don't know, take away their licenses or whatever the government does. So yeah, we went for a walk around the West End and I found it interesting. I liked it. I loved it. You know, I've not done it for a long time. So yeah, no, we went for a walk around London. We, God, we walked down all around Shepherd's Bush. I've not walked around Shepherd's Bush for years. I've driven around Shepherd's Bush, but I've not got off and not walked around Shepherd's Bush. Definitely not walked around Covent Garden, Leicester Square. Um, God, um, you know, down by, there used to be, the, it still is there as well, but we didn't get a chance to go there. Down Going down Clerkenwell Road, there's quite an interesting, God, I don't know, don't know what you call it, quite an interesting bar, sit-down bar, on the left hand side, I will get the name of it and I will give it to you. I'll put it in this chat. Very interesting place. Um, behind um, what looks to be like a Georgian door, but it's actually a bar. You would never guess it's a bar. Didn't get a chance to go there, but you know, some of the some of these old places where we used to hang out are still there, and other places literally have gone. Some roads have been I don't know, bulldozed, where Tottenham Court Road is. There used to be a road behind Tottenham Court Road. There used to be a nightclub there called the Astoria. The Astoria has now completely disappeared, gone, you know, to extend Tottenham Court Road tube station. It's kind of weird, actually. It's weird 
to go to a place expecting to see a building or a road that you've seen for literally 40 years, you know, when you were 13, 14, 15, 16, gallivanting around the West End, central London, spinning on your head and break dancing at Covent Garden, only to go there as an adult and literally the whole road has disappeared. That is, that, that's weird. The whole road, you know, roads and streets and I don't mind buildings, but when they take away a whole, a whole road, you know, where the wag club used to be, it's just all totally different. So it's, in, well, not interesting. It's kind of like, it's, it's, yeah, anyway, it's one of those things without going down that road. But anyway, I'm digressing again. So <laughs> rewinding and getting right back to the point. So yeah, we are going to be looking at those things. So we're going to be looking at uh, um, uh, Standard of Truth podcast, but coming right back, coming right back. What I'm going to do, I'm going to bring up this lovely little article. Now, um, as I said, Diane Abbott, this is the woman you can see, uh, is was a long-standing MP until she fell out of favour. I think it was last year for something she said, can't quite remember, but it was something um, that some people considered to be, uh, I don't know, against the state of Israel. I have no real idea, but that's not the point of what I'm going to be saying now, right? But anyway, that's, I think that's why she was ousted from, uh, I, I don't know if she was in the central, um, uh, on the on the central team in the Labour Party. I, I can't remember because I don't vote Labour and I don't vote Tory either. I don't vote any of them. <laughs> but again, that's another conversation. But anyway, she was removed right from from whatever position she she had um i think now she's a backbencher or was a backbencher i think don't quote me on that because i don't keep up with uk politics probably the way that i should or shouldn't i don't care but anyway so um but anyway what happened here right is that the man you can see in the picture his name's frank hester Right. And and by the way, this happened a couple of weeks ago, and I've been meaning to get into it. But as you see, I've not really been streaming recently because I've been too busy doing business elsewhere. Right. But I wanted to talk about this when it happened. But but anywho, right. So the man on the uh, on the on the right or left, depending on the depending on how your 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 audio visuals are set up, that man decided to I don't know. He obviously doesn't like her. He doesn't like her. So let's read what this man said, right? Let's read what this man said, and then we'll come back and have a little chat. So that's what lovely dear Diane Abbott looks like. And that's what uh, the highest paid donor to the Tory party looks like, to the tune of 10 million British pounds. All right. So here we go. West Yorkshire police has launched an investigation into alleged racist comments. Hopefully you can see that. Alleg alleged raci racist comments made by Conservative Party donor Frank Hester about MP Diane Abbott. In remarks first, now listen, listen to this really carefully, right? Bearing in mind that this has just come to light in the last month. In remarks made, uh, sorry, in remarks first reported by The Guardian, Mr. Hester said the Hackney MP made him want to hate all black women. <laughs> I don't hate all black women at all. And this is a quote. I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. <laughs> now, remember, this has come out of the mouth of the highest paid donor to the Tory party, to the Conservative party, to, to Richie Sunak's Conservative party. Yeah. What's her name? Kenny B Badock. Can't pronounce her surname properly. Right. Her, black woman her party, right? We'll try and come back to, uh, to if I can find it, I'll try and find uh, what she said about it. Make you laugh or cry. The alleged remarks were said to have been made during a meeting at Mr. Hester's company, the Phoenix Partnership, TT, TPP, in Leeds in 2019. That's five years ago. After the comments were reported, Mr. Hester, the Tory party's biggest donor, 
to the tune of 10 million British pounds, released a statement admitting he had been rude about Miss Abbott, but said his criticism had nothing to do with her gender, her being a woman, nor her skin colour. Now, remember, um, his comment was... <laughs> His comment was, let's find it. I don't hate all, all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. She should be shot. So that's a, that's a, that's a reference to her gender. Uh, let's find the rest of his comment. Has it got the rest of his comment here? Because he said more than this. We'll try and find the rest of his comment, but yeah, actually, let's read the rest of the article. Uh, the force said it had taken over the investigation from the Metropolitan Police Services Parliamentary and, Inve and Investigation Team, which had originally been contacted by Mr. Hester's uh, from, about Mr. Hester's alleged remarks. I wonder when. This is the first time the comments had been brought to the attention of the police. Really. Right. West Yorkshire Police said in a statement, it added, our officers uh, have since been working to establish the facts and to ultimately ascertain whether a crime had been committed. I think it has, <laughs> personally. But remember, this guy con has contributed £10 million to the Tory party. So what do you think Richie Sunak's going to do about it? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that. I'm going to leave that to you to guess. Uh, we recognize the strong reaction to these allegations and appreciate everyone who con who has contacted us since the article was published. But when was the article published? What was it four years ago? Or was it literally in the last month? That's the question. Uh, and we'll come back to that. As we continue our inquiry, we are keen to hear uh, from anyone who could directly assist our investigation. Having initially uh, st uh, stopped short of calling the alleged comments racist, Prime Minister Richie Sunak has since labelled them as such. Well done, mate. It took him long enough. This guy was basically bullied, right, by people in his own party and, and by social media and the press to call it what it is. Right? And it took him long enough. You know, you had, to, you know, you had to be, you had to be squeezed out of him. Um, but he has resisted pressure <laughs> to return ten million Mr. Hester donated to the Tories last year. Ten million, he said. No, nah, we're not nah, give it back. Probably not with a Jamaican accent, but you know, it is what it is, All right? So that's that. So let me drop that stuff down, all right? And I will bring up. <laughs> And listen, I love this level of hypocrisy because the, the truth is that is what it is. Pure hypocrisy, hypocrisy, right? So let me bring up this here if I can find it, if I can find it. All right, let's share this, right? Now have a little look at this. Let's bring this stuff in. Du -du 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 right, okay, just, just a couple of little headlines, right? Because I think it just gives a little bit more detail. So, um, do, 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 do. and this is just straight off the web. A Tory minister, I don't know if I meant to say allegedly or if, no, no, you're not, forget that because he, he's actually said it was. He's actually apologized for his comments himself. So, sod that. Um, racist. The Tory minister has said his party would take another 10 million from a donor who allegedly made blah, 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 blah. That's not what I want to read. Uh, do, 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 do. Where's the actual? thing that I actually want to read. I've read that one. Yeah, maybe it's this. Yeah, it's this one. So let me just make sure you can see this. Let me come on to there. Um, just make sure you can, I think you can, can you see that? Let me, uh, actually, let me drop this down. Let me remove that and bring up, oh, let me remove that, stop that, and bring up this this sky report because that's the one that I want to show you right okay so hopefully let me bring that in right so hopefully you should be able to see that so okay so so let's get rid of that oh there you should be able to see that yes cool okay so is it can I actually get rid of that stupid app? Hmm. God, 
Just trying to get rid of this ridiculous ad. Uh, right, this is the best I can do. So let's just read the bottom bit, all right? So um, who is Tory donor Frank Hester and what did he say about Diane Abbott? Okay, so conservative opponents are calling for the party to return uh, 10 million uh, given to them by Mr. Hester and his company after racist remarks he said to have made, uh, have come to light. All right. Now, remember, they've just come to light and this thing happened five years ago, right? 2019, right? That's the key to this. That's a pit picture of uh, Mr. Hester. Right. Uh, businessman Frank Hester has been widely condemned after the uh, emergence of racist comments he reportedly made about Diane Abbott. Uh, Hackney MP uh, Miss Abbott has since responded saying the Tory donors' comments had put her in a frightening position. Basically, uh, and I don't disagree with her, you know, when someone says something, because in this country, listen, Honestly, in this country, you've had people make remarks about people in the public eye. And then you've had one or two, I don't know what's been wrong with them, one or two people who really should be, in my opinion, locked up, um, uh, basically hunt down. Um, I don't know if it's just hunt down these people, that, you know, that are in the public eye. I don't know if it's, if it's because of the comments made or if, it, if it's because these certain people are in the public eye or a bit of both. You know, but you've really got to be careful about comments you make about, especially threatening comments or derogatory comments, you know, um, in the manner that this chap has made them. You've got to be careful because you've got some unstable people who are, who don't understand, who, don't, who, who will, will follow up, right, to put it, you know, to put to put it bluntly, will follow up whatever you say. Now, remember, Mr. Hester's comment was Diane Abbott should be shot, right? So um, is that, some people have actually said that's an incitement for some unhinged people to follow it up, right? So, so that is the comment basically made, allegedly, by this man who's donated 10 million to the uh, to the Tory party that uh, Richie Sunak was uh, doesn't want to give back <laughs> so anyway uh do, 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 do. but who is Mr Hester and what is uh, and what is he reported to have said about Miss Abbott uh how Mr Hester made his fortune the 58 year old healthcare entrepreneur is founder and chief exec of the uh, Phoenix Phoenix Partnership, based in Leeds, uh, described himself as a leading global provider of healthcare technology. Blah 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 blah. Okay, so let's read from here. Do, 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 do. Mr. Hester donated ten million to the Tories last year, including a five million donation to Richie Sunak that came from him personally. Right. <laughs> Are you seeing this? Let me just make sure you can actually, yeah, you're seeing it. Good. All right. Including five million, a uh, five million donation to Richie Sunak that came from his own pocket personally. And another five million that came from his healthcare software firm in November. Rah. Uh, so there's no way. Right? So there's no way Richie Sunak is going to say a damn thing. Well, he, he was, as I said, his arm was twisted. He had to say something. This is crazy. Um, uh, electoral commission records show his ties to the party go back a long way in 2013 he traveled to india with david cameron david cameron that's the man who's responsible for brexit right in my opinion david cameron that allowed some sort of stupid vote that basically has meant that we've all had to get new passports and can't travel to europe as cheaply Right. In 2013, he traveled to India with David Cameron, the then prime minister, as part of what uh, was uh, Britain's biggest ever trade delegation. This trip is worth a lot of money to us. It's inevitable, Mr. Hester reportedly told the Financial Times during the trip. Being with the PM and UK trade investment means we, the right people, means we, the right people. I don't know what that means. But anyway, this is the culprit. And that's David Cameron. They're probably mates, probably old school, I don't know, private school friends, along with this character here, Boris Johnson. <laughs> uh, the following year, Jeremy Hunt, some people might uh, pronounce his name slightly different. Right? Anyway, the following, the following year, Jeremy Hunt, Hunt, 
Um, the then health secretary visited TPP's headquarters saying technology is the key to the 21st century personalized healthcare, blah, 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 foolishness. What were his alleged remarks about Diane Abbott? According to the Guardian, uh, Mr. Hester made remarks about Miss Abbott in 2019. During a meeting at his Leeds company headquarters, the publication claimed he said, it's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on TV and you're just like, you just want to hate all black women because she's there. <laughs> right. And remember, in the last article I showed you, this man's trying to say that it wasn't racially or, or gender motivated or whatever it was. Clearly it is. Clearly it is. Clearly. Right? And I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's not funny. I'm laughing, but it's not funny. You know, when you laugh out of disgust, <laughs> you know, when something, you know, when something's so sad, right? That I, I was going to say, I'm not surprised. I can't say I'm surprised because, you know, as time goes on and there's, Times change. It's amazing how things simply stay the same. Stay the same. All right. There was another article I was going to show you about uh, about a poll that was done in the UK about racism, but I, I saved that for another occasion. All right. Um, Anyway, right, so what are the latest allegations? The Guardian uh, later published more alleged comments made by Mr. Hester about race. This time during a meeting, he called for foreign workers at <laughs> foreign workers at, at his company TPP to address allegations of racism made by former employees in 2019. Right. So this guy's got a lot of this guy's got a lot of stuff around racism swirling around him and has had at, documented at least for the last five years. So God knows what this guy has been doing before that. The Guardian's reported uh, reported Mr. Hester's uh, Mr. Hester spoke at TPP's headquarters, which overlooked the railway line in Horsford, blah, 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 blah. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. So, so this is him speaking again. He is alleged to have then spoken about how staff should be able to joke and tease each other in a loving way before adding, I think we all know the difference between a racial slur and perhaps Asian corner, which is still going on here today. I don't know what he means by Asian corner, unless he's thinking about speaker's corner at Hyde Park. But honestly, I don't know what the guy means by that. I don't know what he means. Uh, Sky News has contacted Mr. Hester for, <laughs> for comment on the latest reports. Um, how has Mr. Hester responded? A spokesperson for the entrepreneur released a, sta a statement saying, Frank Hester accepts that he has he was rude about Diane Abbott in a private meeting several years ago, but his criticism had nothing to do with her gender nor her skin colour. <laughs> the Guardian is right when it quotes Frank saying he abhors racism, not least because he experienced it as a child of Irish immigrants in the 1970s. It is true. For those that don't know, it is true. As my grandfather told me and my mum told me, right, uh, when, you when they came to the UK, the signs basically said, no, and this is God's honest truth in this country, right here in blighty good old UK. No dogs, no Irish, no blacks, or no dogs, no Irish, no wogs, right? <laughs> or whatever the hell it was. And that's the God's honest truth. That's the history of at least Caribbean people coming to the UK, right? That's the truth. I suppose the only difference is they're only going to know you're Irish when you open up your mouth. They know you're black from right down the road. Maybe that's a that's the slight difference, Mr. Hester. Anyways, and I can speak Cockney as much as I want to speak Cockney, but the bottom line is it doesn't rub out my skin colour, does it? Does it, Mr. Hester? Doesn't rub out my skin colour, does it, mate? Yeah? Anyway. My wife said that I can, I'm good at changing accents. I can speak a bit of Cockney. I can speak a bit of Jamaican. I can't speak any Nigerian, even though I'm trying. 
because I'm 50% discovered I'm 50. Anyway, it's not about me. Anyway, well, well, I'm 50% Yoruba. Yoruba, not Yoruba. Yoruba, Yoruba. I'm going to ask if I'm pronouncing that right a little bit later on. Anyway, let's get back to this. He added, he rang, he rang Diane Abbott twice today to try to apologize directly for the hurt he has caused her and is deeply sorry for his remarks. Well, you know what? At least he's apologized. He wishes to make it clear that he regards racism as a poison which he which has no place in public life. How Miss uh, Abbott has responded. I know Miss Abbott, I know Diane's done um, uh, rallies and stuff like that and gotten a lot of support from mainly black women. We'll come back to that in a minute. In her own statement, Miss Abbott, the first UK, uh, the, in, in, sorry, start again. In, Miss, in, in her own statement, Miss Abbott, uh, the UK's first black woman to become an MP, detailed how alarming the alleged remarks were in light of the murder. This is what I was referring to earlier on. The murder of two politicians since 2016, right? And I totally agree with her. So, you know, people in the public eye need to refrain from using the kind of language that Mr. Hester used. You can't. No, you can't. You can't. Can't remember who the two other politicians were, but I'm sure people that are going to watch this are going to be able to go to the web and simply search up the names. It is frightening, said Miss Abbott. I live in Hackney. By the way, um, God, what's the name in Hackney? This used to be a road in Hackney that they used to call Murder Mile. Right? That was a road in, that was the nickname of a road. I can't remember the name of the road, but that was the nickname of the road. And my old church used to be on that road. I can't remember the name of the road though. Cannot remember the name of the road. But would you believe it? Hackney pretty much has been totally gentrified. So Diane, who's still the MP to my knowledge of Hackney, she's witnessed, she's sat there. And one of the things I've got against Diane is that she's presided over the gentrifying of an area that used to have, used to have a thriving black community, similar to Brixton. But Diane Abbott has been there, the MP in Hackney for years, and the, pretty much the whole of Hackney has been completely and utterly gentrified, totally gentrified, yeah? So I know that, um, you know, I know that in America, if you're going to be watching this from the States, I know that, you know, New York's been gentrified, Bronx, Brooklyn, all of these places that had big, massive African-American ADOS populations, um, I know they've been gentrified. I know the rents have gone sky high. I know the apartment and the house prices have gone sky high. I know that. It's happened in Miami, where my brother lives in Miami. That's beginning to be gentrified. You know, I don't know if I know, I don't know if I hope rich white people want to live around the load of Haitians and Jamaicans. <laughs> I don't know. And Seven Day Adventists. I got nothing against Seven Day Adventists. My brother's one. Don't know if do you want to live around a load of Seven Day? And anyway, but uh, whatever. But gentrification, man, Hackney has been completely and utterly gentrified. You walk down Murder Mile now, right? There's, you, you, you're, you're lucky if you see a black person, right? <laughs> you know, you used to be, you used to be you walk down Murder Mile and you just say, hello, Mrs. So-and-so. Hello, Mrs. So-and-so. And Mrs. So-and-so, they say, say, it's how your father, it's how your mother. Say, it's, it's, she's, she's well, he's well. You me see our church on Sunday? Yes, I see that church on Sunday. Right, you've got no intention of going. <laughs> you've got no intention. But anyway, you just say that to make her feel happy because otherwise, anyway, whatever. And Brixton's been gentrified as well. You, you know, so I know what it is to, you know, some, you, you might say, how do you stop it? How do you stop it? If you're the local MP, right, you've got to be the voice for the people in your constituents. And I am not sure to what extent, and I don't, I don't know, to what extent has Diane Abbott ensured the, I don't know what you want to call it, the continuation, the stability, the, um, the, all of those bits and pieces for the African African Caribbean community in Hackney. You know, sorry, but that has to be a question. It has to be. 
Similarly, Lee, Lee, when you think about Brixton and you think about the loss of whatever, of the black community in Brixton, right? Who, I mean, I don't know who the local MPs for um, uh, uh, Lambeth were. Brixton is in a borough called Lambeth, for those of you that don't know. But I, you know, at the end of the day, right, it's the local MPs, right, um, that, you know, that um, solidify community or work against it. Diane Abbott has been in Hackney for years and I can't see, I can't see it. I can't see how she's helped the black community to, to, to control Hackney. I've got to say it in the same way that the Asians may control Southall or wherever they live. And that's great. You know, more power to them. I'm not knocking them. Good, good for them. You know, seriously. Yeah. But anyway, Let's get back to this silly, not not silly article. Let's get back to this article. I shouldn't call it silly because it's actually interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, it is frightening, said Miss Abbott. Hopefully you can see this. I live in Hackney and do not drive. So I find myself at weekends popping on a bus or even walking places uh, more than most MPs. And so she's right. She's got a point. I agree with her. I'm a single woman, not married. And that makes me vulnerable anyway. But to hear someone talking like this is worrying. And I totally agree with her. It is worrying. She added, for all my career as an MP, I have thought it important not to live in a babble. Sorry, bubble. Not to babble. No, I didn't mean babble. But not, not to live in a bubble. And to mix and mingle with ordinary people on Murder Mile. The fact that the, two, the fact that two MPs have been murdered in recent years makes makes talk like this all the more alarming, and I totally agree with her. Totally correct. PM's PM's spokesperson said comments uh, racist and wrong. Yeah, uh, asked about the report. No, no, let's just read through this quick. Asked about the re re reported remarks at a regular briefing with journalist Richie Sunak's official spokesman. Initially said they were clearly unacceptable, but refused stop short of calling the comments racist. We want him 10 million. Not only that, we want him, we, we, any, any money that man have, we, we want it. We, uh, we want it. Probably not in that accent. But he then <clears throat> released a statement later that day saying the comments alleged, allegedly <laughs> made by Frank Hester were racist and wrong. He has now rightly apologized for the offense caused and were remor and where remorse is shown, it should be accepted. Really? So just because this guy has been pressured to basically uh, show remorse, Diane Abbott should accept it. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I think he should be investigated, right? Up to his flipping eyeballs, basically. I don't care if, if Richie Sunak wants to give back his five million. I don't care. I don't care. He's not going to give it back anyway. He's not. Right? I really don't give a monkeys about that, right? But he should be investigated up to his eyeballs, both Richie Sunak and his mate Hester. The Prime Minister is clear there is no place for racism in public life. And as a, <laughs> that's a joke, isn't it? Now, let's read that nonsense again. The Prime Minister is clear that there is no place for racism in public life. And as uh, and as a, and, and as the first British Asian Prime Minister leading one of the most ethnically diverse cabinets in our history, the UK is living proof of that fact. So give back the 10 million. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to play this clown. Let's move on. Uh, Work and Pension Secretary Mouse, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, let's, let's read what this joker's got to say. Right, so Keir Starmer, for those of you that don't know, Keir Starmer is the current uh, leader of the uh, Labour Party, right? So Keir Starmer, uh, London Mayor Sadiq Khan, uh, and other political opponents of the Tories have demanded that the party return the 10 million that Mr. Hester has donated. The Labour leader told ITV's Lorraine, Lorraine, uh, she does morning TV, right? Uh, the comments about Diane Abbott are just abhorrent. And Diane has been a tra uh, and Diane has been a trailblazer. She has paved the way for others. She's probably faced more abuse than any other politician over the years. And um, 
and on a sort of sustained basis. And I'm sorry, this apology this morning that is pretending uh, that uh, what was said wasn't racist or anything to do with the fact she's a woman. I don't buy that, I'm afraid. And I think that it's time the Tory party called it out and returned the money. Not going to happen. The PM has no direct, uh, sorry, the PM has not directly commented on the demands, nor has the Conservative Party, and you shouldn't expect them to. Ask if the party should return Mr. Hester's donations. Mr. Stewart, I don't know who this man is, said, I'm not going to bother reading this comment because I've got no idea who he is. So, so there you go, right? So that's the clowning, right? That's the, that's the best way to say it. That's the clowning that's been going on, right? I find it completely hilarious and sad at the same time right? But that's the clowning that's been going on. But listen, I was listening to my brother Danny God, right? Danny God does a, a radio show on Genesis Radio on Monday from about 6.30 to about 8, 8 uh, p.m. Go and check it out, right? You can find it on, on the internet. Genesis, sorry, not Genesis Radio. Apologies, Danny, if you're listening. Lightning Radio, lightningradio.co.uk, right? That's their website. And you can listen to him Monday, Monday from about 6.30 till about 8. He made the point, he had an angle. <clears throat> so I'm not going to take credit for this. I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you where I got it from. Listen. So remember, these comments were made five years ago, right? These comments, these racist uh, comments by Mr. Hester were made five years ago. Five years ago, not even really in the public eye, but in a meeting in his company. Remember that, right? So why did it take five years for these comments to come to light? Why? And why now? <laughs> why now? Why, why now? Why did these comments come to light now? That's really what you've got to focus on. And, no, and honestly, I didn't think about it. But it only makes sense when you begin to when you ask the when you begin to ask the question, what's going on now in the UK? What's going on now in the UK? So what did I get through my door late last week? What did I get through my door late last week? I'm not going to show you it, but it's around there somewhere. I normally throw them in the bin. I can't find it. It's around there somewhere. But what is going on in the UK, right, in May, early May? Can you guess? Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess what's going on, right, in the UK, right, in early May? Five, four, three, two, one. No? <laughs> Local elections, local elections, right? So you've got the local elections whereby we decide in this country, we decide who's going to be our local MP. So general, and you've got the general election that's going to be, uh, that's more or less going to be scheduled for some time in December, right? So remember, let's look at the whole picture now. I think this is, I think you're beginning to get it, right? So you've got, you got, the, um, you got the comments that were made five years ago, right? Comments that were made five years ago, and they've just come to like last month, or what we're talking about, yeah, late last month. And then you've got the local elections in, um, in I think it's around about the 2nd of May, and then you've got the general elections happening in December, right? What's been happening to Black Caribbean, African African Caribbean support of the Labour Party in the last few years? What's been happening? I will tell you, right? Labour has been losing support. Uh, they've been losing the Black vote. For those of you that are going to be watching this from the States, our Labour Party is the same as your Democratic Party, all right? Regardless of Tony Blair's champagne socialism, regardless of that, our Labour Party right, is the same or similar to your Democratic Party, right? So this party has been losing the support of African African Caribbean people over the last few years. You know, as African African Caribbean people, have, if you like, have become more um, 
uh, what's a good way of saying it, have become uh, more, have moved up into the middle classes, for want of a better phrase, and uh, have begun to own their own businesses, become more, um, if you like, upwardly mobile, all of that good stuff, right? They've basically uh, really just stopped voting Labour. Black people in general have always been conservative with a small C anyway. In the Caribbean, in West Africa, most black people are conservative with a small C. That's just a fact. It's only when we came to the UK, yeah, it's only when we came here that the you know that we basically started voting Labour. To be honest, I don't even really know why. Because it wasn't really as if the Labour Party were any less or any more racist than the uh, Tory party, honestly. But, you know, we started voting Labour, started voting Labour, right? And that's been quite consistent literally up until about 10 years ago, up until about 10 years ago. Even I, you know, the couple of times that I voted, right, I'm, I'm pretty sure even I voted Labour years ago, right? But I'm pretty sure I did. I just haven't voted for a long time because I can't see the point. Can't see the point. Anyway, it's another conversation. So the black vote in the UK has been nosediving. And in the last two, three, four, five years, it's not just been nosediving, it's been going down like that. And it's been black men, black men that have stopped or are stopping or are switching allegiances, right, from the Labour Party to the Tory Party from the Labour Party to the Tory Party. And there's reasons for that. There's reasons for it. Generally speaking, men in general, black men in particular, are sick and tired, sick and tired of being called toxic, sick and tired of, of having all of these slurs directed at us. Sick and tired of having that. And this, is, and this came from my brother, my old, one of my older brothers who lives in the UK, and his wife. At the time, when they told me they voted Tory, it's about six or seven years ago, when they told me that they voted Tory, I was like, why'd you vote Tory? Why'd you vote for them? Right? And I couldn't believe they voted Tory because to me, the Tory party were just racist. And da, 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 da. Right? And I was like, no, 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 no. No, you, no, you can't, if you're going to vote for anyone, you can't vote Tory. Right? And my sister-in-law's reasoning, her reasoning was, you know, she doesn't want her hard-earned tax money right? What she's worked for, she doesn't want that to go to, I'm going to say, because these are her words, not mine. She doesn't want her money to go to what she said was women who've just decided just to make babies and can't look after them. <laughs> that was part, she said a load of other stuff, but that was part of what she said. And I was like, no, 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 you got, you know, you got, you, you, you know, you got, you got to help people that can't help themselves. And I, and I still think that, I still think that now, to be quite honest with you, but I'm going to be honest, right? A lot of men are not, a lot of men want a party who stands for family values. That is what a lot of men want. Not just black men, actually, but white men too, men in general. And a lot of men feel, to use that word, feel that that is not the Labour Party, right? So men in general, I'm talking about black men in this case, simply have shifted allegiances away from Labour, they may, you know, they may vote Tory, they may vote Lib Dem, they may vote for the Green Party. I've got, I've got a friend who wanted to stand as an, was it an independent or was it um, as a Green Party um, uh, member? I can't quite remember now, but um, that, he, you know, that was what he wanted to do. And you've had one or two other if uh, black male and um, people that have stood as independents and stuff like that in the London area. But the point I'm making is, Black men, men in general, black men in particular, have begun to shift from Labour to other political parties, might be an independent. That's just been a shift. So when we think about this whole Diane Abbott issue, when we think about when it happened, which was five years ago, when we think about the fact that we're only hearing about it now, and when we think about the timing of it, that has happened before a local election and before a general election. What is that all about? What is that? What's the purpose and the aim of it? Why now? Why now? So what my friend Danny God was saying on his show was 
basically there's a reason for the timing and the timing is to the, the, the point of it is to try and shift because even black women have been moving their vote from labor to the tory party even black women have been doing that right even black women have been moving their vote from labor to the tory party right so what is what's that so what is the why report that Diane abbott issue now so the point he was making and i totally agree with him is to basically bring back that black vote bring back that black vote from whatever party for from wherever we've gone for whether it be the green party right whether it be the tory party whether it be the group I don't know, the lib dems but to bring back that vote back to the labor party right back to the that's what that one's all about that's the only logical reason as to why this has all come to light right now at this time at this moment when the event when the thing happened five years ago when the thing happened five years ago why now clever and the truth is you're going to get a lot of black people that are going to fall for it that are going to say oh oh the Tories are racist Tories are racist the Tories are racist L let's vote Labour let's vote Labour let's vote Labour a dang be the Tory party is the Conservative party bro but good to have your board but it's this whole thing about yeah you know uh, yeah, no 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 I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna run to vote Labour when the truth is you, you listen you've got to listen to Danny God's show on Lightning Radio uh, lightningradio.co.uk lightningradio.co.uk go and listen to the show because he he's like a dog with a bone basically right he does not he has he, he's been on the back of the labor party basically letting all of his listeners understand that the labor party are no better or no worse than the tory party they're just no better or no worse this whole thing about expecting the black vote taking the black vote for granted in the uk has been going on literally since our parents came to the uk in the late 60s in the 60s right so you're talking about 50 years of black people african african caribbean people in the uk voting for a party that has done so all for us nothing not one damn thing nothing at all I mean, literally nothing, nothing. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. They've done nothing for us. Nothing, 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 nothing you can point to. That's, that's, that is the truth. Now, remember what I said before. You had Bernie Grant, individual people. God rest his soul. Bernie Grant, the late, great Bernie Grant, right? Um, at least he wore African cloth in the Houses of Commons, right? On more than one occasion. At least he put on his garb, his garment, I don't know what country it was, and stood up with his African fabric on and all that in the Houses of, Par Houses of Commons, right? And spoke. And that, that was good to see. That was good to see. But it's going to take more than African dress, right, to deal with a lot of the issues going on here. And, you know, if you've been watching my channel long enough, you will know that I personally think the whole damn thing is too little, too damn late anyway, right? I think it's too damn late. I think it's too late. I think it's too late. Whereas Diane Abbott is absolutely correct, right, that you've got, you know, a racist like Hester ma allegedly making these comments around, you know, Diane Abbott should be shot and all the rest of it, right? You can't be, it's actually dangerous to be making these kind of comments. So in that respect, no one is going to disagree with her. She's absolutely correct. I agree with that, all right? But the timing of, remember, these comments happened five years ago. The timing of these comments right before local elections and general elections, right? Why didn't these comments come out five years ago? Why didn't these comments come out four, three, two years ago? Why haven't these comments, what, what now, right? Listen, if you're one of these people that think that things happen by coincidence, you need to think again. Nothing in politics happens by coincidence. Not one damn thing. Not nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. Nothing happens by coincidence in the world of politics, politics. Nothing. Nothing happens by coincidence. Not one, not nothing. 
right? So the timing as of when these comments came out is what you've got to focus on right before a local election in May, and you've got a general, in the year of a general election, right? These comments directed at really to, to, to stir the emotions of black people to get us riled up against the Tory party, because obviously they're not going to give back the 10 million. And what we, what are we meant to do? Well, what you're meant to do, Mr. Black man, right? Mr. Mrs. Black woman, or not Mrs. Black woman, Miss Black woman, right? <laughs> what you're meant to do is run straight back to labor and vote for them in your local election. Make sense? That is the purpose of it. You're meant to run straight back to Labour and vote for them. Vote for them. You see, if Labour did everything that they said they were going to do, right, then that would be okay. But they speak with forked tongue. <laughs> they speak with forked tongue, 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 in my opinion. You may disagree, but, you know, sometimes you've got to do your own research, which is fine. Go and do it. Go and do it. Okay, very quickly. Adangba, you write, I haven't gotten a chance to look into Diane Abbott's situation. Yeah, do look into it, but don't just look into what you read. Look into the back, because remember, the situation is against a political back backdrop. So you've got to look at what's going on in the country right now to actually get the full picture. Right. Because it's not just because obviously you've got a racist in in Hester, Frank Hester, who basically said what he said. Right. Uh, this man's donated 10 million, the highest donations. Right. The highest individual donation. You've got him donating 10 million to the Tory party. Right. You've got Richie Sunak, who he personally gave five million, as I understand it, based on the article that we just read, gave five million to his campaign to, I think, to become Tory leader. Don't quote me. Go and read it. Go and research for yourself. Right. So you've got that whole thing, which on the surface is terrible. And it is for very obvious reasons. So no one's going to question that. Neither myself. Right. Hopefully that's what you've gotten through what I've been saying. But it's the time in. As soon as you realize this thing happened five years ago, you have to ask the question, why is it just coming to light in 2024 when it happened in 2019? That's the question. Why just before local elections? Why in the year of general elections when we, African African Caribbean people, are shifting away from Labour? Not necessarily to the Tory party either. <laughs> Not necessarily to Green or, um, or what's the other party? The Lib Dems. <laughs> Not necessarily to them. You've got a range of independents. And the truth is, as, I, as I've been saying on this channel now for about a year, there is no more black community in the UK. And it pains me to say, the first time I came to the realization there was no, there is no longer a black community in the UK, it, I felt it right here. I felt it, I felt it in my chest, man. Just, and I realized it when I, while I was doing the stream and the stream I realized it on was when, you, you, and I've kind of you know, I've slowed down listening to American content creators, but when um, Courtney Michelle was having beef with uh, Chantel Simone, and you know, I, I love both of those women, right? But Chantel Simone was correct. She was correct. It's as simple as that. She was right. It was that whole thing about save yourself, black man, or save your community, black man. You may remember that, right? And I just thought to myself, no. There is no community, you know, I mean, and don't get me wrong, the situation for African-Americans, ADOS Americans uh, is similar but different to us in the UK. And I get the feeling that there is some kind of community left, some kind of ADOS community left in the States, but there is none in the UK, right? And I know some people in the UK like to say that, you know, black church in the UK is the black community. I, I know it's not. It isn't, all right? The black church in the UK, you see these people on the Sunday, right? once a flipping week, man. You know, people you see once a week, right? You know, a lot of churches in the UK don't even allow you to do a Bible study. You know, seriously. 
not just because of COVID, they're just giving up doing it. So people that you see once a week, a community that does not make, or at least just not what I, the kind of church I grew up with. These, these people used to come around your house for Bible study in my house where I used to live, even though, even though I, I didn't want them there. <laughs> they used to come around. I couldn't watch Starsky and Hutch. I couldn't watch the Six Million Dollar Man. Right? What other programs couldn't I watch? I couldn't watch uh, uh, John Craven's News Round. I couldn't watch Run Around. I couldn't watch any of these programs. I couldn't watch Thomas the Tank. Not Thomas the Tank. I couldn't watch the Pink Panther. I couldn't watch Scooby Doo. It seems like these people were around my house praying. Literally Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Love. They were always around my house, just praying around my house. And sometimes these pastors used to come to me and try and convert me in my own flipping house. <laughs> the bloody ridiculous. So we we what we are talking to me for? I mean, what? I mean, do I want to talk to you? Go and save someone else. Go out there and bloody well save someone else. Don't come and save me. I'm not interested. I don't need you to save me. I don't need saving. I want to watch the six million dollar man. That's what I want to watch. I want to watch TV. And I don't want you praying in the other bloody room. I've got things. I've got TV. I've got, I've got I've written down what TV programs I want to watch. And I want to bloody well watch that. That's what I want to watch. I don't damn well want you praying in my house and causing noise that I can't watch bloody TV. But the point is, right, <laughs> sorry, let's calm down, let's slow down. But the point is, right, that was a community. When people come around your house, right, that's what a community is, right? When you do church on a Sunday, when you see people once a bloody week, that's not a church. That's not a church. That's not a church. <laughs> you know, do you remember Brad Pitt's character from The Twelve Monkeys, right? <laughs> That's not a church. No, it's not. It's where it's when you see a community is when you see people regularly, Lee Lee. Right. So I think you guys in America, the we if you're going to be watching this on the replay or whatever, right? You lot have still got a community, even though it's full of baby mamas, right? It's something, right? In in this country, we've got no community left. There is no black community, right? Coming back to politics, right? So people are voting their interests now. Does that make sense? So you've got black. So whereas you used to have a block vote for Labour, what's happened now is that because a lot of black people have moved up into the middle classes, similar to American, to America, actually, because I know in America you've got X amount of black men that are now in the middle classes, similar to the UK. Regardless of what picture the government wants to present, right? The truth is a lot of black men and black women have now moved up into the middle classes and are voting their interests are voting for Labour, Tory, Lib Dem, Independence, and the Green Party, and a load of other party. We've got a party called the Monster Raving Looney Party. I'm sure, right, some of the women here vote for the Monster Raving Looney Party, right? I'm sure they do. I am sure they do. I am, I am sure they do, right? So, um, so what Labour's trying to do, I believe, right, and Danny God on Lightning Radio pointed it out, right, Go and check out his uh, station. You'll find it on at on the internet, lightningradio.co.uk. Great discussions, but very good discussions around the shenanigans that the Labour Party try to play or have played, right? This, I think, and I agree with Danny, this being one of them, the timing, the whole thing, that the aim is to get back the black UK vote. That's what this one's all about. So, you know, don't take my word for it, guys. I've gone on about it long enough. Do go and do your own research. Dangby, go and do your own research, bro. You wrote here, I'm just going to read out some of the Dangby's comments very quickly. Yeah, but why are black women voting for the conservatives? Um, well, you know, black women vote. You've got a lot of people voting for the conservative party for various different reasons, you know, you're going you're to get black women voting for whoever. But the bottom line is in the UK, Dangby, mostly, for the most part, black women vote Labour because that's where most of the perks are from. You know, it's the whole thing about, it's similar to the Democratic Party. It's the whole thing about um, the, uh, they get more benefits under Labour. It's as simple as that. It's literally that simple. More benefits under Labour. Yeah. Adambi also writes, not really any, uh, not really any black community in the US either. So not really any black community in, oh, right, not really any black community in the US either. Uh, everyone is thinking about themselves. Uh, I hear that quite sad, really, but 
I take your word for it. When African Americans become more integrated into American society, and the uh, majority's culture began began going down, African American culture or what was left of it began going down as well. I hear you. I hear you. Also, I also think it's um, well. I talk about the UK. Um, there's been a what people have tried to do in the UK is redefine what the word racism means right? They've tried literally to shift the meaning, right? So it no longer specifically is about colour. Does that make sense? So if you can make the word racism mean prejudice, just general prejudice, then what that means is that I'm not related to systematic power, which is what racism is actually means then what you can do is disarm people that with this complexion so that they have so that they do not have the vernacular to talk about the situation that they are in does that make sense so they've mixed up swapped around you know free card molly you've played free card molly on Oxford Street, it's the whole thing about just mixing stuff up really, really quick, right? So that the word prejudice now means racism, and the word racism now means prejudice. That's what's gone on in the UK, on television and in schools. But anyway, <sighs> boy, but anyway, it's another conversation. Listen. So, you know, do go and read all of that stuff for yourself. Go and read it all for yourself. And, um, you know, you did hear me, uh, moving on to the second topic, you did hear me talk about church a little bit, didn't you? Right. So I also, in the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at a brilliant podcaster. I actually remember, uh, it's called it's called The Standard of Truth. She's a Christian uh, African-American podcaster. Brilliant discussion. She knows her Bible very bible based i got to be honest i love listening i love her discussions right so she had a discussion uh was it recently i'm sure within the last week right i think she streams two or three times a week very good conversations she knows the bible as i said and she's not afraid to try to deal with current topics and you know tries to make the word applicable for what's going on today right but still tries to stay bible based right which which i which i uh, think is good right so anyway she had a conversation entitled or a live stream entitled is the black church in trouble right so that was the, that was the conversation what i would normally do and i'm trying not to do it anymore i would normally play a bit of the live stream and critique critique it and talk about it but the problem with youtube at the moment is that you, you don't know whether or not they're going to give you a strike or do something silly on your channel so you can't do it anymore or at least i don't want to do it anymore so i would tell you what it was all about the conversation in the conversation she has some guests up did she or did she not no no she did i don't actually i don't think she did but actually, no, she did, didn't she? Right. So the conversation, the conversation they were trying to have or that they did have was, you know, as I said, you know, why is the black church in trouble or is the black church in trouble? Right. And so they spoke about church leadership, you know, church leadership, not following the Bible, uh, shying away from following the Bible and bits and pieces like that. And all of it was correct. You know, everything they said pretty much was was correct i'm not knocking it um but th there's a couple of areas that for some i'm not sure why excuse me there's a couple of areas i hope you didn't hear that, but anyway there's a couple of areas that they shied away from right and I, I sat there waiting to see and and i did add to the chat as well right uh there's a couple of areas that they that they shied away from right which for me if you like are some of the biggest areas, some of the biggest issues in, I'm going to call it the collective black Western church, right? Now, why can I say this? I can say it because I'm a Christian, right? I've been a Christian. I've been a youth pastor. I got baptized. I, I, I had to go to church when I was a little baby, but I got baptized in the late nineties, right? I've been a youth pastor. I've run men's ministry. I've co-led men's ministry starting, I don't know, 24 years ago, 
literally, right? And I've been doing it off and on ever since, um, as well as doing a load of other stuff in church, right? So I can talk and I'm going to, right? And what I like about her conversations is that she speaks very freely. Uh, do go and check her out, Standard of Truth post- podcast. She, she speaks, she's not afraid to speak very freely about how she sees the church and church issues and how the church relates to uh, society in general and all of those bits and pieces. So I think for those reasons, great podcast. But, it, you know, but two things that they didn't talk about in terms of why the black church in America, and I'm going to add the UK not Af- not the African continent, because a lot of this stuff they don't they don't go for yet on the African continent. But one is Christian feminism, right? And the fact uh, and whether or not Christian feminism has feminism fem- feminism has a part in the Bible. They didn't touch it. They didn't touch that conversation at all, right? And also the fact that most uh, most Pentecostal Black Baptist whatever churches in the West do not have men's ministries, right? Or the men's ministries are weak. They have women's ministries, but they don't have men's ministry. So there's no or very little male development for males, whether whether they be young males or older males. There's very little development in the collective black church, whether it be in America, I believe. I mean, at some American churches, because I've checked, and UK churches have got fairly decent men's ministries, but you know, on on the whole, there is there are no men's ministries at all in any of our churches at all, right? So there's women's ministries. You got a creche. You got something for the old people. They take the old people down to the seaside so that the old people can you know wade in the water, wade in the water, you know, so that they can wade in the water. All of that good stuff, which is absolutely fine. But when it comes to men. And developing men, developing young men, when boys get to be about 18 and they no longer can belong to the children's ministry, that's it. There's nothing for them, right? Not at all churches, but at far too many churches. There may be, there may be at some churches, they may have a youth ministry, but at what age does a young man, if you like, move from being in the youth ministry to something else? At what age? You can't stay in the youth ministry all your flipping life, yeah? Until you're what? Until you're, so you don't go from a children's ministry to a youth ministry. Youth ministries might may go on, I don't know, to, to when the kid is about, you know, early 20s, maybe 18 to 24, maybe, right? But what about after that? Do you go, are you meant to go from being 24 to being 64? It's a question, right? So they didn't tackle that either. They didn't tackle it. So, you know, in answer to their question, right, which was, is the black church in trouble? I would say yes. And I would say for those, many of those two reasons, there there are, why would men go somewhere, right, where the environment does not cater for them in any way whatsoever? Why? For what purpose? <laughs> why? Right? Why would men go to a church, right, and stay there and sit in the pew and warm a bench when there is nothing there for them? In fact, right, all you get from the pulpit is berating, right? Berating. There's a women's ministry that caters for the women, and there should be, by the way, there should be a women's ministry. There's nothing wrong with women's ministry. But when you have a feminist, women's ministry, Christian feminist women's ministry, and no men's ministry at all, why would men go? All you get is berating from the pulpit directed at you as a man. You're walking through the door. You know, all the women actually, they're actually, most, some of them are actually looking for a husband. They look at you. It's happened to all of us. It's happened to me. You walk into a church, you sit down and you see, immediately see all the women's eyes go like, <laughs> look at you like that, like your meat, <laughs> you know, and you, you just come because you want to hear the word. You want to hear the word, you know, you know, you want to, you want to basically experience, you know, just being, being that crypt in, in that space, right? Maybe you're looking for a church because the last church basically had nothing, there was nothing there for you. There was no ministry there for you as a man to get involved with, no work, no outward facing work, 
No, when I say out with facing work, I mean work outside the four walls. They expect you to clean the toilet, do the PA, play in the, um, in the worship team, or be an usher. It's ridiculous. The pastor, listen, pastors need to have a vision for men in church if they want churches to grow. And what you'll find is that there is very little vision for men in black Western Pentecostal Baptist, uh, I don't know, I don't know what churches you have in uh, in the states, but just say black churches. There's very little vision for men. So why go? So in my opinion, that's the reason. Because if there's no men there, right? If there's if there's very few men in your church, if you're watching this in your Christian, right, and there are very few men in your church, as far as I'm concerned, it's a dying or dead church. I don't care what anyone says. It's a dying or it's a dead church. Share this with your Christian friends, man. If there's no men, right, if there's no men in your church, right, or if there's very few men, if there's not a plan for the men in your church, if there's not a strong men's ministry, or at least as strong as the women's ministry, right, then your church is a dying or a dead church. There needs to be a men's ministry to develop the, the males from 18 years old up until they're pff, 65. There needs to be a clear plan for the men if you want your church to be a thriving church. Not only that, if you want the women in your church to be protected. I'll give you an example of what I mean in that respect, right? I remember one time I was at church and there was a there, there was a sister there who, you know, quite a lively sister. She, you know, she, you know, r r just a, a Christian sister in the church. A, a brother was there that I've never seen before, never met him before, right? But we, for some reason, we all got talking afterwards. <clears throat> oh, no, it's not true. He got talking to this Christian sister. <clears throat> Excuse me. He got talking to this Christian sister. And I could see at the corner of my eye that the conversation was becoming uh, just a, what was the word? a bit uncomfortable for the Christian sister. So all I did, I just joined the conversation. That's all I did. This is after the service. I just joined the conversation and just 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 tried to lighten the conversation. And she eased off to the side and walked away and just left me talking with this brother. And he had, well, I don't, I don't quite now understand what his issues were. But he, he had whatever issues he had. But just imagine if if we hadn't, if I hadn't have been there, or if there weren't a lot of men there. You see, the purpose of 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 men, really, or one of the purposes of, of men. Actually, no, I'm not even going to go there. But but the point is, <clears throat> men are valuable for 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 any environment. I think you get the idea. Men are valuable for any environment. And when churches make no effort to work with men, to cater for men, to men, when churches, if churches only berate the men that are there and make the environment uncomfortable for men to be in, they're not going to go. And so therefore you cannot talk about a thriving church, right? When men simply don't want to go there. I mean, the joke back in the day was that men used to simply drop their wives off at the door right, of the church and sit there and read the sport, read the sport back pages, right? For a couple of hours. And then there are five hours, <laughs> if it's a Caribbean church, right? Five hours. And then when his missus comes out, he just used to say, you, you enjoy yourself? She, she would say, yes, yes, man, a good service that I ah, yeah. And then say, come back, we go home now. And then they would go home and have some curry goat and rice and peas and ackee and saltfish. That was it. That was the running joke. And it was true. It was true. Maybe she would bring out a patty, right, for him because she knows he's sitting in the car. <clears throat> that was the joke. But there's, there was a level of truth to it. It was the whole thing about men not feeling that man right? That man not feeling that that environment had anything for him. Pastors basically have to develop a, a plan for men in their congregations, if they want their congregations to flip in well grow. Anyway, Danby writes, Christian feminism coming in subtle, in a subtle form uh, of ought towards men, uh, passive aggressiveness and entitlement. Uh, did I miss anything? Yeah, pretty much. That's it. It's a lot more than that. I mean, there's a whole, 
Um, I mean, I've sat on uh, God. Um, you've got a theological school in Birmingham called, what's it called again? It will come back to me. But anyway, they sometimes host brilliant discussions on a Thursday. Um, a few months ago, about six months ago, <clears throat> they had one Christian feminist on it from America, right? Um, she zoomed in from America, right? So the conversation, it's amazing how they read the Bible, what they do, they take the authority of the, what's written in the Bible. They basically take the authority of men out of the Bible. That's basically how they read the Bible. That's how a Christian feminist reads the Bible, right? And um, and that whole the theology really is dominating the black church in America and the UK now, right? That's the truth. And for some, that's fine. Uh, other people may see it as basic, may, may simply ask one question. Where is it written? Where is that written in the Bible? And that's the question any Christian should ask. Where is it written? Show us what you're saying. Where is it written? And that's the deal right there. Now, where is it written? That's the only question you need to ask if you're a Christian, right? And it will rub a whole heap of, uh, got to say it, Christian feminists up the wrong way. You know, it's as simple as that. But the point is, Pastors need to, and one of the points of the uh, Standard of Truth podcast is that um, she, uh, she did, to her credit, they had a conversation around uh, pretty much, and, and she showed some clips and stuff like that, where she quite rightly said, these pastors are um, trying to appease the world, right? Or if you like, man's culture, the culture of, of society, rather than adhering to God's culture, right? Does that make sense? The two are different, right? In that sense, she was correct, right? But um, but anyway, right? So so anyway, the church, you know, um, I just simply said all that to simply say that the church in the West, if you like, is dying, and I'm a member of the church in the West, right? So I feel I have the right to speak. You know, this is the other little thing. Black men in the West, men in general, black men in particular, have been told that our voices are crap, that you need to shut up your voice. In fact, you should be voiceless. You should shut your mouth, give your tithe, but shut up, shut up. Your voice is not worth listening to. Shut up, shut up, right? Shut up. The only time you're allowed to speak is when it's up to the age of 18, maybe, and after 80. So up to the age of 18, and then from the age of 80. If you're in between, then you need to shut your mouth. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Right? So that's partly why I'm talking. <laughs> uh, you know, because you only live once. And, you know, you've got to, I believe you've got to, you got to stand, you've got to stand on something. And when it comes to faith, um, no, I, I like to, I like to stand basically, right? Especially when you know that uh, the thing that you love, the church, is being misrepresented, right? Misrepresented from the pulpit, which is basically one of the things she said, which was correct, which is correct, right? Pastors being afraid to talk, speak Bible, just afraid, just afraid. It might be because they know they get most of their tithes from women and they don't want to, um, that they don't want to stop these ties from coming in. It could be any reason. It could be any reason under the sun. But the point is, right, they avoid speaking Bible. It's as simple as that. But anyway, you know, a great podcast. Do go and check it out. Standard of Truth podcast. Great discussions. Uh, she's very professional. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, it's pretty much Bible-based. It's it's worth, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> definitely worth checking out. Definitely worth checking out. Right, anyway, right, going to get on to the last thing I want to talk about. Um, I, actually, there's one other little thing. I'm pretty sure, even though, look, even though what's happening with, what's, what's her name? Fanny, I can't remember what her surname is now, right? But anyway, you know, she's a DA uh, who's been been put in charge of uh, prosecuting Donald Trump, right? Um the, you know, another pod, another two podcasters, actually. The lead attorney's been really doing that. I've been following that. It's been hilarious. Right? I've got to say, you know, listen, if you're 
one of my African-American brothers or sisters, man, you are crazy. <laughs> I thought we were crazy in this country, right? But you guys in the, Fanny Willis, thank you, Adambi. But you, my African-American brothers and sisters, man, you lot are crazy with a capital Y on the end. You lot are crazy, crazy. <laughs> this Oman, <laughs> Fanny Willis, right? One of my ADOS African-American sisters, right? Middle-aged, um, one, one of my African-American middle-aged sisters, right? She, <laughs> she, she's been having a fling with one of her underlings, right? So I don't even, I don't even quite understand it. But anyway, they've had the, they've had this long court case, right? Which has been, which has been crazy. They've tracked their phone, um, you know, with the GPS on the, on, on their mobile phones. He's, this guy called Nathan, is it Nathan? Nathan Wade, have I got the, have I got his name right? A dang beef, I've got his name wrong, just write in the chat. So this guy called Nathan Wade, who's been having, having a fling, a married man, you know, having a fling with, with, with his boss, old Fanny Willis, right? Not Fanny Willie, Fanny Willis, a dang bee. get, get her name right, been having a fling with her, right? And so they've tracked his motor, so they've all denied it, more or less, did they deny it? I don't, well, anyway, whatever, right? But the point is, his, they tracked his mobile phone stationary around her house. <laughs> oh, God, look, it's just been a, that's been a comedy show, right? But anyway, um, so the they've had the judgment or verdict, whatever the, you guys call it in the States, whatever they call it in the States, and the judge basically said, Fanny Willis can carry on with the court case against Donald Trump. I don't know if there's any point her continuing with it, if I'm really honest with you. I seriously don't understand the point of her continuing because the focus is going to quite rightly be in, be in, it's going to be on her and her shenanigans with this, with Nathan Wade, if I'm getting his name right. That's where the focus is going to be, right? So she may as well retire from the case, in my opinion. Um, but but anyway, you know the judgments come down. The judges said you can continue with uh, you know with uh, dealing with the uh, Trump case, Miss Willis, but your 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 ex lover, <clears throat> Mister Wade, has to quit. You've got to get rid of him. If you keep him, <clears throat> then the both of you have to go. So guess what? Fanny Willis has decided to do. Guess, Fanny Willis has decided to get rid of her lover, right? <laughs> just, she's just kicked him to the curb, right? Just booted him, kicked him out the front door. <clears throat> and she's going to continue with the case. So I've just found that really quite funny. So you've had uh, uh, the lead attorney doing great commentary on that. Brilliant, quite funny. He's had loads of people listening. I've been one of them. And I've got to say, um, Dennis Sperling has also done good commentary on it as well. And both of them, it, what's interesting is that both of them, they've, they, you know, they've got a 20 to 30 year uh, background in law, right? So that's the key with this, right? You, a lot of people have made comments, right? But it's, it's a lot better listening to people that are in the profession talking about it. So that's been the lead attorney and Dennis Sperling, right? Quite interesting. And to be quite honest with you, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I, we've got no dog in this fight, right? We're in the UK. I'm, I'm living in South London. Well, actually, I'm not living in South London anymore. That's where I was born and brought up. But, you know, we're in London, man. We've got no dog in the fight. So it's just been a case of literally getting some, um, getting some gluten-free crisps, because I'm gluten-free, getting some gluten-free cr crisps, some carrot juice, and sitting down listening to the lead attorney's commentary of this fart foolishness, right? <laughs> and it's been better than watching Netflix, man. Listen, um, you know, people do talk about uh, black male media, right? But honestly, some of the funniest stuff I've listened to, right, has been some American podcasts. It's just been it's hilarious. I've got to say, I don't care. I mean, in this country, you've got, you've got, um, you've got um, uh, Sarah Garvey, very intelligent pod, British podcaster that I listen to. Go and listen to his channel. Good conversations, right? Um, and uh, King Richards, you know, he, he's funny. He just reminds you of guys that I grew up with, basically. All right, so, you know, good to listen to. And uh, I do miss Falcon Black's conversations. And God, who else is there in this country? 
you got you got my young brother uh, JM as well. You got loads of people that podcast there, but those American ones are. I, I'm not going to swear. Bloody fun. I think bloody's not swearing. Bloody funny. <laughs> That just, you know, make me want to wet myself, right? But anyway, funny, 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 funny. But anyway, right, listen, let's get to a topic that I do want to talk about. So what, um, this is the last one, right? So let me bring this up, right? Now, the title of this podcast, after one and a half hours, right? <laughs> let me bring this up. Let's bring this up, right? So, okay, so the title, you've seen the title of the podcast, Apologies for coming to this so late. <clears throat> Actually, why well I've done them. Why am I apologizing? But the title of the podcast is Women of Kenya. Women of Kenya. So you know, you know that I've been um, uh, focused recently, or not so recently, on property, apartments, and all the rest of it in Ghana, property and apartments in Kenya, right? <clears throat> the whole idea being why talk about what's not working in the UK in terms of relationships and all the rest of it? <clears throat> you can't force people to do what they don't want to do. Everybody's got the right to be and do and live how they want to be and do and live, fine. But so have black men, right? So I say that to say, guys, the world is a big place. It's a big place. And um, one of the streams I did months ago was trying to get men in general, black men in particular, to see their community, to see the black community as being a global one, to see the black community as being a global one. We as black men should not see, or rather, we as black men now need to view the whole world, right, as a potential black community. What do I mean by that? You've got black communities in the Caribbean, you've got black communities in South America, and you've got loads of black communities all over the African continent, right? If you are not interested, you know, and I want to make this clear as well, right? You've got community in Asia, you've got community all over Asia, you've got community in, in India, you've got community, you know, in, as I said, in South America, you've got community in Eastern Europe, You've got community everywhere on planet Earth. And truthfully, wherever you find community for yourself, right, wherever you find self, you know, fulfillment, wherever you feel you can make a difference, right, go there, right, <laughs> go there. The point is, guys, you are not stuck. You do not need to stay in your part of the West, right, and be viewed as toxic. If you've got a son like me, I've got an 18 year old boy, right? I'm, I'm scared for my son because I don't want my son. You know, we grew up in the UK, walking down the street in the UK with a police stop us because quite clearly they would stop us because to them, they saw us as being toxic. Somehow, we young black guys, we're going to do something wrong. We're going to commit some sort of crime. We're going to do something, which is why they stopped and searched us. <clears throat> so um, basically, we do not need to remain in a part of the world and have ourselves and our sons be viewed as toxic. We don't have to. We don't have to. It's not fair for my son, right, who's just 18. I mean, he's about that much taller than me, literally, right? But why is it fair to have to label my son just because he's a male? Why is it fair to label him as toxic? That's not fair. And honestly, I wouldn't be doing my job as a father if I didn't suggest to him that, you know what, you know, after you finish your film degree, you can go and find a place anywhere on planet Earth. I will give you the money after, your, after you've graduated to spend two years traveling around the world, basically, just looking to see where you may find some sort of life, you know, the world, the world, this is a big world. And we don't, you don't need to remain somewhere where they don't value you and where they view you and what you are as being toxic. You don't, you don't have to. 
Those days are gone, man. <clears throat> Those days are gone. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. So, and I want to make it clear, for me, as I've said continuously, for me, that continent is the African continent. That's where it is, right? Thankfully, I've been able to find a decent woman to marry, right? And I'm not saying everyone should get married, nothing like that. You, you do what you need to do for you, right? For me, right, I, you know, and honestly, if I didn't find my wife, right, I would probably have left this country probably about a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. I would have gone already. That's just the truth. I, I, I don't think I would be here if I hadn't have met her. We plan on leaving and going to Ghana anyway, right? That's our plan, right? But, you know, the point is, right, I'm just encouraging you guys, wherever you are, whether that's in Europe, whether that's in the UK, or whether that's somewhere in the Americas, right? All right, more probably uh, applies to South America, uh, North America, right? But don't think you need to sit and suffer, right, where you are. Suffer in terms of how people view you and what God made you, right? Your, your, your masculinity is God-given. God made you that way. In the same way that God made women the way God made women, right? God made you the way God made you. And you don't have to apologize for that, right? There's a per there's a reason why God made us the way we are. We, we, built the wo we built the world that everybody else enjoys, literally, the infrastructure. So you don't need to apologize for these things. But to be, but also you, you don't really want to be slagged off. You don't want to be belittled, none of those things. So, so the idea guys is that, uh, the last few streams, the last few of my streams have been about encouraging men to try and find a life or think about finding a life elsewhere. So I've looked at property a lot. I've looked at apartments. I've looked at, uh, how to make money out of property, all of those bits and pieces, just in Ghana and in Kenya, right? <clears throat> As I said before, I'm going to be looking at a lot of other African countries. Do go and look back at the last few streams, right? Interesting. Think about what you would normally pay for a apartment or a house in your neck of the woods, whether that's in the UK or whether that's somewhere in the States, and then look at how much you could get, you know, look at how much apartments and houses cost in Ghana and or Kenya, right? And then you will begin to see, as long as you can work remotely or set up a business, you will begin to see it's viable. It's viable. <clears throat> but that's not the only thing, right? One of the big things, you know, because let's be honest, right? If you're a black guy living in the West, right? <clears throat> in 2024, most of us are very apprehensive, quite rightly, to get married, to tie the knot with with in in the West, we're just apprehensive to do it, right? Simply because we have read and seen the divorce figures. Let's just be honest. And it's not men in the West doing the divorcing. It's not, generally speaking, generally speaking, right? So we've got to take a view on that. Now, the issue is, if you want legacy, if you want legacy, then how are you going to, how's that going to happen for you in the West when the figures say that it's not it's not men breaking marriages, generally speaking, how are you gonna get legacy? If you don't, if you want your children to grow up under your roof, how are you gonna get legacy? How? How's how's that gonna happen? How's that gonna happen? You've got to be honest about this. If you're under 30, if you're a guy under 30, it's not necessarily an issue for you. But if you're a guy, say 34 plus right? And, you, and you're thinking of, you know, I, I want a wife now. I'm ready to have a wife. I've done my playing around. I've done my traveling. I've built my business, or, or at least I've solidified my career. If you fall into that category, and then you're a smart man, and you've read the statistics around divorce in the West, then it's going to, you may begin to think, you know, bloody hell, you know, this feels a bit unsafe to do it in the West, Right, so what the hell am I going to do? How am I going to do this? The lead attorney, you know, really pushes uh, prenups, which is totally fine. But there is another alternative, and the alternative is to travel elsewhere. That's the alternative, to travel elsewhere. Now, we, as I said, you've seen the thumbnail, women in Kenya, right? So as I'm talking to you, let me set up this, what I'm going to show you now. The point of what I'm going to show you is to say this, right? There's method here, right? I am not, I want to make it clear, right? <clears throat> I am not saying, let's bring it up. I am not saying that 
the women in other countries or the women in Kenya are physically any better. That's not what I'm saying. I am not saying that the women in Kenya are physically any better, because I don't think they are uh, any better looking, rather, any better looking. I don't think they are. I don't think the women in Kenya are any better looking at all. That is not the issue here. Let's add this in, right? That's not the issue here. So, you know, if you're an African-American in the States or if you're in the UK or if you're in France and you're watching this, Italy, anywhere where you're watching this, right, you're going to see women who look like this, right? Personally, I think black women are gorgeous to look at, right? Um, academically brilliant, all of those bits and pieces, academically great, um, um, great to look at, attractive, you know, obviously my mom's a black woman and I've got, I've got no black sisters. I've got three black sisters in law. My, you know, I've got four older brothers. Those of you that have watched my channel have heard me say this before. I've got four older brothers. Uh, three of them have been married to great black women, right? Uh, of Jamaican heritage for God, for plus, plus, was it 25, 30, plus 30 years, and my oldest brother got married in the 80s. The one after him got married, I think the other two got married in the very early. No, no, God, no, they all got married in the in the late 80s. <laughs> oh, thinking about it, they all got married in the late 80s. <clears throat> one day I'll show you one of one of the pictures of me at one of my brother's weddings, right? Oh boy, it's when I had hair. But anyway, all right. So they all got married in the 80s. So they were lucky enough, fortunate enough, blessed enough to marry, right? Some amazing black women of Jamaican heritage. As you know, two of my brothers live in the States. One lives in Maryland, right? Uh, just outside Baltimore. And the other one's in DC, sorry, in Miami, right? <clears throat> Joe, oh no, God, what is he? Uh, Seventh-day Adventist, right? And then I've got one bro, I've got two brothers living in the U UK, London. Uh, again, you know, I've been married for many, 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 many years. So, um, you know, I love black women. I think all the women, white, Chinese, whatever, I think all women are, are attractive, but my penchant is for black women. I love black women, right? Um, however, <laughs> um, what you're going to, let, let's be as positive as possible. What you're going to find in Kenya, on the African continent, in Ghana, in Somalia, Adangbi writes Somalia, what you're going to find is not only and these women that you're seeing are all from Kenya. These are all Kenyan women, right? Some of them apparently are famous, but generally speaking, they're, they're all Kenyan women, right? Some of them you're going to say, oh, well, they're all models. You're going to find these women walking around in London. You're going to find these women, I'm sure, walking around in New York. You're going to find these women, I'm sure, walking around in Miami. You're going to find these women, I'm sure, walking around in every city on planet Earth, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to find these women walking around. So, so, so it's not the physical stuff that I'm focused on. What I'm focused on is the mindset of not all, not all, but most African women on the continent of Africa. Now, remember what I started out by saying, if you want a legacy, if you want legacy, if you want a family, if you want to marry, to marry, if you want to get with a woman who wants a uh, marriage for life and not just until she's bored or not just until she has lost herself in the relationship and doesn't know who she is anymore and needs to go and find herself. If you want something opposite to that, if you want a woman who values, who doesn't see you as a man just from being a male, as being toxic, then you may want to think about the African continent. Again, as I said, you've got, you got Asia, you've got South America. All of those women are great. But the whole thing about, oh, you know, a, a society, trying to find a society that doesn't automatically see you, see just what you are as being toxic, Right. You know, I don't want my son to be seen as toxic. He's 18. He's a kid. 10 years ago, he was a baby at primary school. So I don't, I don't want him to be seen as toxic by the society that he decides to settle down in. That's really important for me. So I'm, I've already advised him, hey, listen, after your degree, I will pay for you, right, to travel to South America, me and you will go to Brazil. If you're, you and your mates don't want to go, 
I will. Be, you can come to Brazil with me. We can check out, go to Bahia, check out some capoeira. We can go to, um, but definitely go to the African continent, Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, uh, Burkina Faso, where 50% of my DNA comes from, which means 50% of his DNA comes from. Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, Botswana. We'll check out all of these countries, uh, Zimbabwe, even South Africa. We will check out these countries. I'll check out with him and just to let him know that, hey, there's a, he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to suffer being called derogatory names, whether they be racist names or sexist names. He doesn't need to suffer that in the UK. He doesn't need to suffer it. He doesn't need to suffer of this barrage of berating just because he's a black, young black man, right? So yeah, you know, so so I want to make it clear, right? This is not, I am not saying that these women are perfect. That's not what this is, that's not what this is about. What I am saying is that these women are more traditional. That's what I'm saying. So you're getting the same, you're getting all of the hardware that you would get from uh, black women in America or black women in the Caribbean or black women in uh, in, in the UK, you're getting all of the hardware, which obviously as uh, heterosexual males, we we want, right? But also you're getting women who are more traditional, are happy to be, um, uh, are happy for their husband to take the lead, are happy for their husband to be the protector, are happy for their husband to be the provider, are happy for their husbands to be their heads, again, which is a Bible reference, Bible says that the husband is the head of the wife. It doesn't say that the husband is the head of the house. It says the husband is the head of the wife. That's what it says, all right? We need to get the one clear, right? So that is what you're getting when, you know, when you, um, you know, when you uh, go to, not all, but very many African countries now. I want to make it clear, right? Things are changing all over Africa. But I don't know, it's, maybe it's because of social media. You've got a lot more people, a lot more women checking Western social media, right? Um, now that's got its pros and cons, but one of the cons is um, the whole thing about the breakdown of traditional values, or if you like, uh, women on the African continent that are letting go of their traditional African values. Uh, values. Remember earlier when I said that um, most African countries are conservative, uh, most African cultures are conservative with a small c. Remember I said that? It's true. It's still that way, right? Conservative in terms of dress, conservative in terms of um, outlook, con conservative in, term in terms of family makeup, right? So an extended family as well, right? So all of those things are, are still there, still in place, although it's slowly beginning to break up, right? Slowly beginning to disintegrate. But I would say, in my opinion, it's about 20 to 30 years behind, right? African, African, Caribbean, African American communities in the West, right? So this is, a, so what I'm saying here is if you want legacy, if you want a wife who doesn't believe in divorce, if you want someone to be there, if you want if you want a situation that you that's worth your commitment, that's worth you dying for as a man, as a husband, that's worth you killing yourself for, that's worth you going out and breaking your back for, which is what men have historically done for their wives and kids and family. If you want that kind of a situation, then you may want to consider any country on the African continent. Obviously, we're looking, and, you know, to be honest with you, one of the reasons, one of the motivators is not just about making money and having houses and property and all that kind of stuff, but it's also what kind of, what kind of relationship, what kind of woman you can find, what kind of wife you can find to marry. That's also it. Most men actually want to be married, but most men do not want to be taken for a ride like their fathers were, like their fathers were. Most men don't want that. Most men want a family and kids. Most black men want a family and children. That is what most black men want, but they don't want their investment to be made in vain. They don't want their investment to be made in vain, right? 
you know, I was on a live a few months ago with Jess X. She was on, she, I had the pleasure of, uh, of her coming onto one of my lives. And she said, uh, you know, the, 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 I can't remember the topic of the live, but it was something like, um, um, is the juice worth the squeeze? Right. It was something like the question was, is the juice worth the squeeze? That was the content of the, uh, you know, that, that was the question. Is the juice worth the squeeze? So, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of black guys living in the West, living in America, living in the UK, we, we ask that same question. Is the juice worth the squeeze? We have to be honest about it. Is the juice worth the squeeze? So in the UK, is the cold weather, moving on from women, is the cold weather worth the squeeze? Some some think it is and some think it's not. Personally, right, you know, there's aspects of London that I've loved over the years, the nightclubs, the theatre, the restaurants, the range of foods that you can eat, Borough Market where you can go and get different foods, Brixton where you can go and get different foods from different cultures. It's good. You know, you've got so much going on in London, right? <clears throat> but, you know, you've got to make your own judgment call about these things. But is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the disrespect from your boss, and again, some of us get on well with our, or our bosses at work, you know, but is the, is, the, is the disrespect that you may or may not get from your boss and your girlfriend or the women around you, your church sisters, <laughs> is the juice worth the squeeze in your little part of the West where you currently reside? Is working to pay uh, that's your sky high rent and mortgage, is that worth the squeeze, fellas? Is the morning rush hour through the rat race in New York, in, I don't know, in whatever city you're in, in the States or in the UK, in London, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the damage to your black male mental health, right? Because again, living in the West, believe it or not, um, there is, uh, and I've spoken about it on this channel already, right? Um, <clears throat> listen to this, right? Um, figures for mental Ill, Ill health in African countries, for Africans in Africa, is the same as it is for Europeans and white people in America, right? But black mental ill health for African Americans and black Brits, because I know you, you African Americans like to call us black Brits, even though we don't see ourselves as black Brits, right? At least I don't. But our mental Ill, Ill health is higher for us as black people living in these countries than it is for white people. But when you, but Africans in Africa, their mental ill health is the same as it is for white people in white countries. So make that make sense, man. So, you know, so you, you, we as black men living in the West need to prioritize our mental health. Meditate on that. Um, are the endless coffee dates, dinner dates with entitled uh, delusional modern feminists worth the squeeze, right? That's a merry-go-round, man. You know, and honestly, I've been on dates like that where, anyway, but is it worth the squeeze? You might think so. And that's fine. <laughs> that is fine. If you think so, good for you, right? Seriously, if you think so, good for you. Good for you if you think so. Good for you if you think so. And I want to make it crystal clear, man, there's aspects of living in the UK that I, that I have enjoyed over the years. I've enjoyed all the nightclubs. I've enjoyed, you know, we used to run nightclubs in London, right? I've enjoyed all of that. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed all of that. I've enjoyed the, uh, in the early 80s, when, when the hip hop scene came from our African-American brothers, when we got the, when we got hip hop from our African-American ADOS brothers, right? I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed all of that all of that early scene in the very early 80s, 82, 83, 84, SAS breakers and poppers forever. I enjoyed the, the Covent Garden break dancing. I enjoyed going down to spats and the whole scene down there. I enjoyed the, you know, the all of it I enjoyed, you know, that was great. And then later on the clubbing at the electric ballroom and going down to, God, where else? Um, uh, uh, the, the Camden Lock going down to, was that Dingwalls down there and all of the warehouse parties and all of that. I enjoyed all of that. You know, we've, we've had some good times in the seventies, making bikes, literally finding bikes. I say finding bikes. I'm not going to say stealing bikes, finding bikes, taking the handlebars off and creating new bikes, getting great big cow horns and popping wheelies. I enjoyed all of that. So there's aspects of it that were fun. 
that were fun. You know, being at secondary school, not getting the chance to go down to the Brixton riots, but the very next day having all of my school friends in 1980, 81, 1980 and 81, or whenever the first and second riots are, were and sit, having all my school friends come up to school, come to school the next day with new games, new trousers, new gabiches, and new farras, and new waffle trousers, new ballet shoes, you know, and being jealous. Well, well, man, I didn't get down to the rights, man, to get anything, man. Didn't get no, my, you know, my Adidas, you know, my, God, what, Adidas Bamba, Adidas Mamba, Adidas Samba. I, 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 there, there's a massive long history of, enjoyment that we've had in the UK. But I am now the age that I am at, right? And I can't look back. I've got to look at what's happening now and what I want to happen in the future. I've got to look at that for my life and my son's life. Right? And I'm just basically saying to you, you may want to do the same, right? There are gorgeous black women living all over planet Earth. All I'm saying here is that you may want to think about where you're going to get one with more of a traditional attitude. That is what I'm saying. It's up to you. This is about choice. I'm not, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm simply saying you're going to find more women with more of a traditional attitude on the African continent. Am I saying it's perfect? No. Am I saying that um <clears throat> I am I saying that some of the views of some African countries, uh some people in some African countries is, is a bit ski with? Yeah, of course it is. Am I saying that some of these women are not gonna purely be after you for your money? Well, of course they are. You know, they, they, some of them are gonna be after you for your money. <laughs> but how is that different <laughs> to being to women anywhere else? You're going to be expected to pay for everything anyway. And so, you know, in my opinion, as long as the woman's doing what she should do, then what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Seriously, nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with it, you know? And if you're seriously looking for legacy, right, then what you're going to do is screen out and vet the ones that are not looking, that are not also looking for legacy. It's as simple as that. You're going to have a massive, wide selection of gorgeous, beautiful African women in Kenya, gorgeous, beautiful Kenyan women, right? And you're just going to have more to choose from. It's as simple as that. And you're going to have more to choose from, from a bunch of women who actually want to stay married, stay married. You know, you've got to use your common sense, obviously. You've got to use all, you've got to use your wisdom, obviously. If you haven't got wisdom, ask for some, right, from him. You know, wisdom is a free gift, ask, right? <clears throat> right, but you've got to use, you've got to use your nous, right? Because when you go, you're going to have people, you're going to have people, not just women, but people coming from all directions, trying to get a piece of you because you're a foreigner, right? And, you know, I was listening to Falcon Black stream, and he did say that, you know, when you go to any one of these African countries, they will see you as a foreigner. He's correct. Absolutely. When you go to any African country, they, they will see you as a foreigner when you open up your mouth. Sometimes they can look at your clothes and say, nah, man, nah, nah, look, look the way he's dressed. That guy there is a foreigner, right? Just from the way that you're dressed. But more often than not, it's going to be when you open your mouth and you talk, right? I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. It's going to happen. That's going to happen. If I go to Jamaica, right, they don't see me as a Jamaican. They see me as a foreigner. I'm a English boy. That's what I am. I'm a English boy. That's what I am. I'm an English boy. Fine. I am. <laughs> to them, I'm an English boy. To me, I'm an African, but to my Jamaican family in Jamaica, uh, even to my mum, even to my granddad, even to my brothers that were born in Jamaica, three of them were born in Jamaica, two born in the UK, even to them, me is a English boy. Right? I don't care <laughs> because, you know, you've got to know what you are. I know that I am an African. I know I'm God's son, right? That's, that's really what I am, right? But from an earthly point of view, no, I'm an African. I'm 50% Yoruba and I'm 50% Burkina Faso. My, uh, but I have a Jamaican uh, culture, uh, heritage, 
not even culture, heritage. You got to know what you are, man. That's why I've done the bloody DNA test, right? You know, <laughs> that's why I've done it, right? Um, yeah, anyway, all right, getting back to the point. So, you, you know, so yeah, no, you will be seen as a foreigner. But guess what? If you have children there, if you get married there and you have children, do you think your children are going to be seen as foreigners? Do you think your children are going to be seen as foreigners? What about your grandchildren? You see, in the UK, I am a second generation, uh, you, you know, um, Jamaican in the UK. I was born here. <clears throat> Actually, that's not true. Third generation. My granddad came here in 1960. My mom came here in 66. So I am third generation in this country, right? Do you think, right, when somebody as dark as me walks down the street, not just in London, but out of London somewhere, do you think people don't stop and do a double take because they see a black guy? <laughs> what do you think? Be honest, man. What do you think? So I'm saying all of that to say that, you know, one, two, three generations down the line, if you settle in any African country, you will no longer, right? be or at least your your legacy your 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 children will not be seen as foreigners in the UK in any european country right we're always going to be seen as foreigners all the ways that's just the fact right it's just what it is i'm not saying you shouldn't stay here i'm just stating something that's a point of fact right we can we can not it's not about liking it but it's about saying whether or not it's true or not all right um so so guys, um, I just wanted just to make that point really, right? That um, the women you can see on screen, you will find them all over the Caribbean looking like this. You'll find them all over England looking like this. You find them all over America looking like this, more or less, right? All right. Some are slightly bigger though, but that's a different conversation. Right? <laughs> uh, but the point here, the point here is what the, I'm, I'm focused here on the software, if you like, what's going on up here right? What's going on here in the minds of uh, uh, African women and whether or not that's worth your time, your effort and your relocation. But we'll carry on looking at, looking at making money. We'll carry on uh, looking at jobs, not jobs. We'll carry on looking at um, uh, um, uh, uh, apartments and houses and how to relocate. I'll have guests on the channel looking at all of that. I will definitely do all of that. But this one is simply about saying the other thing that as men, the other thing that we are interested in because we're heterosexual, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. There still isn't, it's not illegal to be a heterosexual male. It's not illegal yet, right? So the other thing we're going to be, we, we are interested in is a relationship or and or a marriage, right? But the idea is to find someone who wants to not just get married, but the idea is to find someone who actually is interested in staying married. That's the idea, to find someone who's actually interested in staying in it for the rest of their life, right? And what I'm saying here is that the more traditional uh, a woman is, right, in a traditional culture, you're going to have more chance of you getting that and having some kind of legacy with children who grow up under your roof. That's the basic point, all right? Oh, boy. All right, so I'm going to read out some of these comments, man, and I'm going to let you go. Didn't mean to stay in there for two hours. So, a Dangby. A Dangby. Why is it a Dangby? Thank you for being in the chat, bro. I'm, I'm, you're the only one who's... Anyway, right, but thank you for writing in the chat. So, a Dangby writes, in the 90s and early 2000s, African young women weren't privy to this aspect of Western culture. That's the God's honest truth. truth. And that's this has been an issue of social media, global social media, and taking on basically social media destroying the fabric of your traditional culture. The thing that tied even, even black Brits, even us here in the UK, right? Prior to social media, we had a more cohesive uh, community. Well, it wasn't perfect, but it was more cohesive. Post the um the in 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 i don't know uh people taking up social media right it's changed dangby also writes 
if you dress up to date in fashion and have clean look, they can tell they can tell you're not you're not from there in Africa. Absolutely. Right. Uh Danby's last comment. If you don't consider yourself black Britons, then what do you consider yourself as? Myself, I consider myself an African. Straight up. I have done for I don't know, God, I have done for over 30 years. I think I said it earlier on, actually. But I consider myself, I literally consider myself an African, right? Literally, the DNA tells me that. Literally, my DNA is literally uh, fit pretty much 50%, sorry, 98.8%. I went, I did African ancestry. So I mean, that's what I go by. It's a fact. It's it's a literal physical fact, right? So ninety eight point eight percent Yoruba. It's not about me liking it. It's just a physical fact on on uh, mum's side, which was a shock to me because my mum is quite light skinned, right? Um, to me, compared to me, she's light skinned. And on my dad's side, it's a hundred percent from Burkina Faso. How the hell? How the, I don't even know how that happens. Literally, I mean, he's he's a dark. He's darker than me, right? So. So that's crazy. So, and with African Ancestry, um, which is an African American company, it it's interesting because it pinpoints the literal village, pretty much where you come, where your DNA comes from. It's not, it's not cheap. That's my only thing. It's, it's not cheap, right? Um, but that's what it is. So, hopefully, the dang be that answers the question. So, you know, for me, I deal with facts. It's, you know, but heritage wise, obviously, there's a Jamaican heritage or culture cultural practice, which, you know, really is, I mean, I hardly ever eat, uh, I mean, I love Jamaican food, right? But I, you know, I hardly ever eat it because my mom's passed away. So generally speaking, I eat, you know, Caribbean Jamaican food when I go to a takeaway or to a restaurant or when I go to my brother's house, right? <laughs> right? Um, or when I go to some, some family member's house, you know, do, do I spend all day in the kitchen cooking Jamaican food? I ain't got time, man, because it takes ages to, to prepare. I just haven't got the time to do it well. Do you understand? So the rice isn't hard, right? So the rice isn't hard and the gunga peas isn't tough. You have to soak it overnight and then you, nah, come on, man, I ain't got time. And, and you, have to, um, you have to prepare the chicken and all that the night before, you have to season it. And then, yeah, come on, man. If you've got to do the same with the, with goat, and most of it ain't even goat, it's mutton. And mutton isn't goat. I used to think mutton and goat was the same thing. My mum, who's passed away, God bless her, who was a chef, she said to me that mutton and goat isn't the same thing. So listen, if you're going to go to a Caribbean restaurant and they try to say to you, you ask for curry, goat, and rice and peas, and they try to sell you mutton and rice and peas, look them straight in the face and say, this is not, this is not goat. I ask for goat, right? Do what my granddad used to do and say, me want goat, me want goat, man. Me want goat, goat, man, goat. Me want, the, the, the thing say curry goat and rice and peas, man. And I said mutton and rice, I me mean, want it, man. The backside, right? That is what you need to say to the owner of the restaurant, all right? Yeah, a dangby. Yeah, honestly, yeah, that's that's what it was. The, the, so my mum, the DNA. I mean, a lot of Jamaicans, right? A lot of Caribbean people. I speak for Jamaicans, right? Um, the, the, the DNA goes right back to Ghana. I'm surprised with Burkina Faso. Well, Burkina Faso and Ghana are they border each other, right? So it goes right back to Ghana. Um, the tribe, you know, the, the people in Burkina Faso is the same people, and it goes back to Nigeria. So mainly those two countries, other countries too, the Gambia, Togo, uh, God, um, Sierra Leone, um, and other countries right along the coast. You probably already know that um, um, uh, Africans in South America, you're talking about, you, you, you know, Nigeria. You're also talking about Angola. That's where capoeira comes from. Started in Angola. You've actually got two types of capoeira, uh, capoeira original and capo, capoeira Angola, right? So the name tells you where the where the people came from, right? So, so you know, um, yeah, that's genealogy, all right? So, so uh, goat and mutton are two different animals. Well, there you go. <laughs> So, so, so you can tell, you know, when you go to a Caribbean restaurant, you can say, is this, is this mutton or is it goat? 
So if you don't take away anything else from this live stream, take that away, right? The next Caribbean restaurant you go to or the next Jamaican woman who says she's going to cook for you, right? Say, is it mutton or is it goat, right? Take that away from this live stream, guys. It's been great. It's been good. Hopefully you got something from this. Subscribe to the channel, uh, share it, hit the like so you know whenever I go live. And guys, it's been good. I've enjoyed it. Hopefully you've gotten something out of it. This is not to browbeat anyone. This is simply to say, guys, there is an alternative. That's all it's about. That's the direction the channel's going in, right? Am I not allowed to tell men that there's black men that there's an alternative? Come on now, right? Come on. So that's basically what the stream's been about, okay? Guys, I will catch you on the next one. Dangby, thank you for join, joining us, bro. You've been it's been it's been great. And take it easy.